all of this. It's good to be here and to welcome all of you to worship our great and wonderful God. We're just going to begin with a, a good old hymn. To God be the glory, great things he has done. into being. And you are the one who sustains all life and all space, all matter and all things. And you have put us on this earth to be your people. And in the pages of scripture we read how you chose men and women to reveal your glory and to lead your people. And we read again and again of how 
people have ignored your call, turned to their own ways, rejected your love and your rule. We acknowledge that we, in our turn, have failed you. For we have not always been as loving towards others as we should. We have not always used our time wisely. We have not always put you at the very centre of our lives. Made you our reason for living and the one who gives us our sense of worth and belonging. Forgive us, Lord, we pray, and put your spirit in us, that we may live lives which bring glory to you, and which proclaim the love and the grace and the power of your Son, Jesus. We acknowledge that it is only through him and through what he did when he died on the cross, that we have any right to come before you. O oh Lord our God, you have done great things, and we look forward to the great things you will continue to do in us, with us, and through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. The last verse of the, the hymn we have just shared together spoke of our wonder, our rapture when Jesus we see, and as his people, we're called to focus on him. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but I suspect that if I ask the question, how many of you know the chorus? Fix your eyes upon Jesus, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I guess most of you probably would. I guess also that most of you probably wouldn't know anything other than that chorus. I certainly do. It was just that that seemed to have survived. But to help us focus our eyes on Jesus, we're going to listen and join in if you want to um, a song which takes those words as the, as the starting point but add others to them. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
First uh, uh, of our readings, John chapter 13, verses 31 to 35, is quite um, a long set of chapters in John's Gospel from um, about this one, slightly before through to 17 and 18, which are sometimes referred to as the farewell discourses, because they recount the, the teaching that Jesus gave to his closest friends, the twelve, um, to prepare them for his coming betrayal and crucifixion. And uh, this is, is part of that extended passage of John 13, 31 to 35. And um, Judas has just left the uh, meeting in the upper room where Jesus was with the disciples. When he was gone, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And turning to book of Acts. Remember what happened on that day of Pentecost when the Spirit came on 
not just the 12, but on many who were with them. Uh, Peter stood up and preached what I guess is the first Christian sermon. And there was a great explosion of people coming to faith in Jesus. And then, of course, things have to, to begin to settle down and what were people going to do? And in chapter 2, we read something of what the first groups of Christians did at their in Jerusalem. And just a, a few verses from the end of chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We'll be thinking uh, about those words in particular a little bit later. But it is significant, isn't it, that when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he didn't say to them, um, go and perform wonders, go and preach. So that a little bit later, but in that, the passage from John's Gospel we heard, what he said to them was, it won't be by signs and wonders, it won't be by other things that people really know who you are. It would be by the way you behave towards each other. By your love for one another, other people, he said, will know that you're my disciples. As I said a bit later, he did say, and it's recorded in Matthew's Gospel, the last, last few words of, of Jesus on this earth, go and make disciples. Go and baptize, go and preach, go and teach. And when he had them close to him all together, he said to them, It's by your love that people will really know that you're my disciples. It doesn't matter how clued up we are about the scriptures, how theologically we can talk and understand things if we don't love one another and show that in practical ways. One of the, the ways in which we can care for each other and, and for people around the world is by praying together. And uh, we're going to do that now and share some prayers of concern. Um, there is a response that you can make if you wish to do so. There will be times of silence when uh, you can add to the prayers or, or make them your own, however you choose. Anybody feels that they want to pray out loud in those times of silence, please feel free to do so. In faith, let us pray to God our Father in the name of his Son Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. God of love, we pray for the life of your church throughout the world. think especially of our Christian brothers and sisters in places where they fear for their lives or they fear for their relationships, their employment, simply because they acknowledge Jesus as Saviour. We pray for those who have already experienced persecution. But we pray also for ourselves and for this church, for its life and ministry. 
bread, it may continue to be known as a place where people care for one another. May every congregation be a community of love and every Christian a witness to your grace. Renew all who worship in this place, that we may be a living fellowship in your spirit and serve our neighbourhood. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God of mercy, we pray for the life of the world, a world in which there seems to be so much trouble and turmoil, a world where people's lives are destroyed or diminished by war and conflict, by the forces of nature, and by their increased ferocity due to the actions of human beings. We pray for a world in which so often people seem to be struggling for power rather than fighting for a better world for them. Pray for a world lighted by the coronavirus pandemic. <clears throat> Pray for our government and all who govern the nations around the world that they may do so with wisdom and a desire to serve, not to be served. I pray that you'll continue to show us how to live as members of the human family, to reject the ways of war, to bear each other's burdens and to work together for justice and peace. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Out of compassion, we pray for those who are ill or anxious at home or in hospital. In the silence, let us bring names to God. People whose needs he already knows about. Let us remember that our prayers are effective. Lord, we lift Barry and Nancy Chambers to you, Janet and Bob Greenfield. And also Pam and Nick Stokes. We pray for those whose lives are filled with fear and despair. Draw near, we pray with your saving love and bring healing and hope. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your will be done. For the Lord, we rejoice in the communion of saints. We remember all who have faithfully lived and all who have died in Christian life, especially those known to us and those who have in some way helped us to understand more of the love of Christ. Help us to follow their example and bring us with them into the fullness of your eternal joy. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you as such good things as pass our understanding. 
pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And that's some of our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer and in the form that's on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from the kingdom of glory and now and forever. Amen. It's beginning to feel a little bit more like what we used to call normal. It's beginning to feel that we have a little bit more freedom. Yesterday evening, for the first time for perhaps close to two years, um, we as a family went to a live music event, Crumbs in the Park in Heathrow. And it was good, and the weather turned out to be very helpful as well. It was good to be sharing that, good to listen to people making music freely again. But things have changed, and some things have, I believe, changed for good. They talked about a new normal, and we don't yet know what that is. We don't even know what a new normal uh, it means anything at all anyway. But we have to change. We have to adapt. We have to come to some accommodation with the fact that there is a new disease circulating that isn't going to go away. In the church, we have to adapt to. And I guess it may be that this kind of hybrid service, if I can call it that, where some people are in church and some are watching, thanks to the wonderful technology that we've been able to harness. And I guess that might continue. But I hope also that, that we will develop, we will build on that, that we won't lose it, that we will begin to think about ministry online, how we can reach people with the good news of the gospel, people, many of whom, spend as much time in that virtual world as they do in what we might call the real and tangible world. People who rely on the internet uh, and the um, various sites you can access, be it social media sites or news sites, who rely on the internet for their news, whereas once we relied on a television or a newspaper. People whose social interactions are conducted more in virtual space than they are face to face. And how the pandemic has changed life for lots of us. Even people who only doubled uh, now have perhaps become that bit more proficient in using the internet. But whatever changes we might make, whatever new technology we might harness, we must not forget who we are as a church. We might have to put aside some of the ways we have done things and adapt new ones, but who and what we are doesn't change. 
Now, I'm not a great fan of the, the kind of person who would say, if you want to know what the church should be like, just read the New Testament. And the reason I'm not a fan of that is that if you read the New Testament, or particularly St. Paul's letters, you very quickly learn that the church in its very early days was not perfect. Nor was every church in every place the same. They had different concerns. They did things in slightly different ways. And boy, did they have their problems, just as we do too. The early church was not perfect. But saying that you won't find a blueprint for the church in the New Testament is not the same as saying, don't bother to look at the New Testament. And I do believe that if you look at the pages of the scriptures, you will find pointers to what the church, and let's just remember, the church is the people of God. We call this building a church or a chapel. Maybe this is the chapel and the church is up there, but we call places churches, but actually the church is the people. And we can find pointers as to what the people of God should be like in the New Testament. And it seems to me that this passage from Acts, if it doesn't have it all, has most of what we need to know. So let's think about that. The early church, and, and let's remember that this passage refers to people in Jerusalem in the very early days. They'd just begun to gather to meet. What we find from this passage, the church, that group of Christians, was a learning church. It says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles, those who had been closest to Jesus, those who knew most about what he had taught, those he had commissioned to continue his work. And the early Christians were serious about knowing what Jesus had taught through the ministry of the apostles. And it seems to me that the church in every age needs to be serious about that teaching. And the church has pondered and thought about that over the years, and we have traditions and we have teachings, and many of those are good and faithful. So they are not, we might need to ditch them. But what hasn't changed is the record of those teachings in the scriptures. The evangelists who wrote the Gospels, Paul, who wrote his letters, all were devoted to the apostles' teaching. All were able to pass it on. And so we need to be serious about finding out and exploring what the scriptures say through, through personal reading, through listening to good sermons. I'm not necessarily saying this is one, but through listening to those who are gifted as teachers, as Bible teachers. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. It was a learning church. Secondly, it was a church which valued fellowship. For them, meeting together was a priority. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Still, verse 43. Later on, uh, that's emphasized in the way that they continue to meet. And we'll come to that uh, a little bit later. A church which knew the value of fellowship, knew that to grow as a Christian was not something that can easily be done in isolation. But it was important to meet with other believers. And meeting with others and sharing our insights and the things God has done for us and taught us builds up 
the fellowship helps us all to grow. It was a church where they valued the sacrament, as we would call it, the Eucharist, the Mass, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. For them, it wasn't quite as formal as practices in our church today. And they would certainly share bread and wine at, at meals, ordinary meals, and not just in special gatherings. But sharing bread and wine is remembering Jesus. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And people need repetition. People need things which remind us of what we already know, but can so easily forget. And as we later like share bread and wine, we will recall what Jesus did for us on the cross. The early church was serious about the breaking of bread together. Devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were a praying church. And I would suggest to you, not with any sense of pride in my own achievements, that prayer is what keeps us going. It's the power of prayer that enables us to serve others who are not here, but who are in need, as we have prayed a few minutes ago. And it's been said that a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. We don't fully understand prayer. It's, it's very much a, a holy mystery, which means we cannot completely delve into how it works. But we know it doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on our ability to use fancy words or to string sensible sentences together. Prayer is the calling of our spirit through God's spirit. And the effectiveness of prayer depends not on us but on the one to whom our prayers are made. And that's why God says, bring to me all kinds of prayers and petitions and requests. It was a praying church. They knew the power and the importance of prayer. The church in the sense of all, I don't know about you, but I don't think I do all very well. When was the last time that you stopped for a moment and just marveled at the power and the glory of God. It was the last time that a shiver went down your spine because you realised you've been in his presence. Now it might have been that, that, that as the uh, New International Version has it, they were filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles, separating the two, or was it as some versions translated, or because of, or at the miracles? Either way, there is that sense of acknowledgement of God's power, and also that it is revealed in action. Because it was a church where wonderful things happened. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And throughout the ages, God has continued to work, sometimes directly in inexplicably wonderful miracles, but also through people. The work of doctors and nurses and others in the health service has been spotlighted in the last 18 months as at no other time, perhaps. They've done wonders. 
people have become exhausted in serving. Isn't that a miracle? That God has given to people the gifts that have enabled them to do what they've done. And in the church too, we need to be aware that God is at work and can and does do great things. There was a sharing and caring church. Uh, they had a particular way of doing it. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. That particular way of being church, it seems, didn't actually persist for very long. Although, uh, right through the ages, there have been groups uh, and communities of Christians who have lived in that kind of way. The, the monastic communities have been an example of that. But for most of us, it will not be quite like it was here. But the principle is that there was sharing and caring. Remember what Jesus said, by your love for one another, people will know that you're my disciples. A sharing and caring church. Surely, whether it's now, post-pandemic 2021, or then, early in the first year, the first, uh, first year, the first year of uh, the existence of the church, sometime in the thirties, AD. Sharing, caring, loving, supporting. The worshiping church. We are here today to worship God. We have a friend who has told us a story on a more than one occasion. Um, she had, for, for reasons I won't go into, stopped being a regular attender at a particular church. Um, she was still worshipping, but not there. And she met somebody, or she, she actually went to that church one, one Sunday, uh, and somebody at one of the congresses said to, him, said to her, why are you still coming? Don't you miss your friend? And Sue said that her reply was, that's not primarily what I come to church for. I come to worship God. And though, of course, it's good to be a group of friends, a group of believers together, and we've talked about the importance of fellowship. Although that is important, it's also vital to remember that when we come, we come to worship. To give God his word. In whatever way we do that, through, through our singing, through our praying, through our listening, worship is important and central to the life of the church. And here we come towards um, some of the more uncomfortable things. Early church was a church which made a favourable impact on the community. He broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sin hearts, praising God, worshipping, and enjoying the favour of all the people. Well, I guess that was a little bit of license on the part of Luke when he wrote Acts, because I don't think the religious leaders at, at the time were particularly impressed, but all the people. There was something about this bunch of disparate people that had come together, that were united around the belief uh, that in Christ God had walked this earth and had done something special. And there was something about them that created a favourable impression. And you know, that's something that we struggle with as a church. I've been associated in one way or another with Mark Bosworth's Free Church for over 30 years. And in that time, the number of people coming 
has gone down. You've worked. I always say this, this, this church has worked in such of it has punched above its weight in trying to reach people, but actually how many new disciples have been made? You know, one of our Methodist ministers who has said on more than one occasion, <coughs> you can probably go back 150 years before you come to a time when the Methodist church was growing. Now, praise God, there are churches that are growing, even if the number of Christians in Britain is going down, there are pockets of places that, that defy that. But across the world, there are many millions of people becoming Christians. We can praise God for that. But we also need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, why are we not? causing a favourable impression. Why are we not growing as a church? Why are we not taking this wonderful news that we have and effectively, effectively reaching people? I haven't got the answers. And I, just as much as, as, as other people, have failed. Failed. A hard word, but it's true, have failed to sufficiently reveal the grace of God within me that others have come to fail. <clears throat> Not through me, but through what God has done. And the historic denominations in Britain, by and large, are in the same position. We need to, to ponder and um, wonder at why that is what we could do is change. And the bottom line, because these people didn't fail, and we're here today, but also it was a growing church. And it seems to me that these ten things that we find in this passage, some of you might find others, might disagree with some of those are I mentioned it seems to me that yeah, we have the principles, not a blueprint of how we should organize our church, not detailed instructions as to how we can become a growing church, but we have the principles and the practices which every church should have. And praise God for those that are evident in this community. Whatever we do, however we change our methods, our ways of worship, whatever we do, we mustn't forget who we are and what we are. We are the community of those who are disciples of Jesus. And as such, these are the things which need to be evident, which need to be part of our community. And speak to God. Amen. <clears throat> it was a few hours before Jesus would be betrayed by Judas, but reclining around the table. He and his disciples shared the Passover meal. And at that meal, bread was broken and shared. And several ritual cups of wine were passed around. And as their leader, as their teacher, Jesus was central to, to what went on. And at the appropriate time, he picked up the bread. And as he must have done many times before, he broke it. 
But this time it was something different. Because he has, he handed it round. He said, this bread is my body. And it's broken for you. Eat it. And whenever you do it in the future, whenever you break bread in the future, remember me. And the meal went on. And at the appropriate time, the last cup of wine. And Jesus took it and he changed forever the meaning of that color. But as he passed it, he said to them, this cup contains my blood. And that blood will guarantee a new covenant, a new relationship between you and God. And as you drink it, remember me. And since that time, groups of Christians have met together and broken bread and shared wine. Some of them use wafers. Some of them pass a single cup. We used to come forward and take the piece of bread that was put into our hands and drink from that little glass tumbler. And some of us might remember that and think, oh, I've only we could do that now. But it's no different that your bread and your wine are on the plates beside you. It doesn't make it any different at all because as we do this, as we share together, we will remember Jesus. Remember that he took bread and broke it and gave it to them. Remember that he took the cup of wine and told them that forever onwards, the wine will be a symbol of his blood, which he will shortly reject. Or we share a prayer. He is bread. Here is wine, Christ is with us, he is with us, break the bread, taste the wine, Christ is with us here, here is grace, here is peace.
until he comes Jesus crucified In this breath There is healing In this cup There's life Now would you join together to say a prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy, and on that we depend. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may forever live in him. And he in us. Amen. Let us take together the bread. And as we eat it, remember that it is the broken body of Christ. We take the bread. And remember that Jesus' blood was shed on the cross for us. We'll say together this prayer. We thank you, Lord. That you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all people. Amen. If we are to be a church like uh, the one depicted in those verses and uh, having the characteristics that they have. We need always God's help by the power of his spirit. We need to be renewed in him. And our final hymn um, reminds us of that. Now. Lord, thy church on earth is seeking. I just warn you that it does cut in virtually straight away. <laughs>
may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on each with one of us and remain with us now and always. Go in peace, in the power of the Spirit, to love and serve the Lord. Amen.